There we go. Oh, come on. Let's try that again. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to Sunny Lane United Methodist Church. I am Pastor Adam, and it is a joy to uh, be worshiping with you this morning. Uh, today is our Commitment Sunday as we are uh, uh, continuing on in our stewardship uh, series. You should have received, some of you at least, uh, a letter in the mail with a commitment card included. If you did not, you can grab a commitment card uh, ne that's next to the, uh, the offering drop box back there, or if you're worshiping with us online, uh, you can send one in by email as well. Uh, so uh, thank you for your faithfulness in uh, supporting the ministries of our church. We will, uh, during the last hymn, we will bring our commitment cards forward and place those in uh, the basket here in the middle. A couple of announcements for you. We have a busy, busy week ahead of us. Uh, we have our trunk or treat uh, this coming Saturday. Uh, so if you have not signed up for that, I encourage you to do so. Uh, we will uh, be participating in the trunk or treat this coming Saturday from 5 to 7 p.m. We'll start setting up around 4 o'clock. We'll do that in our parking lot here, and the city's trunk or treat will be going on at the same time. Hopefully, we'll get some good uh, intermingling there and be able to support kind of what they're doing uh, at the same time, uh, and should should work out well, and looking forward to that. Then also on Saturday is our pancake breakfast and sausage breakfast and our UMW bake sale, uh, and of course on Friday is our, our men's sausage grind, so uh, looking forward to doing that. And, uh, and then next Sunday we also have our charge conference, our annual uh, kind of church uh, business meeting. And so just a lot, a lot going on this week and looking forward to all that God has in store for us there. Uh, as we enter into worship today, I am looking forward to hearing uh, from Pastor Felix, our associate pastor, preaching for us this morning. And it's a joy to have him uh, be able to preach for us uh, today. As we enter into worship, let's stand as we are able and join our hearts and our voices together in our call to worship. We step off the streets, away from places of work, shopping malls, social media, and news broadcasts, to stand before the living God. Our help is in the name of the living God, maker of heaven and earth. We turn away from the world and the patterns of power that too often hurt, trap, and swallow us up. We stand before our helper, the God of mercy, who rescues and renews us. We come to this Sunny Lane Sanctuary, seeking the living God, maker of heaven and earth. We present ourselves to the living God, who is compassionate and merciful as a living and pleasing sacrifice. Let's join our hearts and voices together in singing, Oh, How I Love Jesus.
Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, he descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. From Luke chapter 14, verses 25 through 33, listen for the word of the Lord. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything, you cannot be my disciples. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Get, you, you can all be my uh, be my kids today. <laughs> well, as we're thinking about what it means to be followers of Jesus, uh, this scripture passage tells us, won't you first sit down and estimate the cost? And I was reminded of uh, when we are going to build a house, when you're going to build something, uh, you, you lay out the blueprints, and it's these big giant sheets of paper that have de very detailed uh, uh, instructions on how to build that house or e erect that structure. And uh, if you don't follow those to the T, you could end up with uh, a wonky looking house. And uh, you could end up with uh, maybe a roof that doesn't quite stay upright or a door that's crooked or a wall that doesn't uh, stay straight. Uh, or, you know, angles that aren't quite square or whatever it might be. 
And so we, we know when we sit down to, uh, to build something uh, that we got to follow those instructions carefully and we want to do it from the ground up. We don't, we don't want to build the roof first before the foundation is laid. We got to do things in the right order. And so we, uh, when it's the same when we are called to follow Jesus. If we want to follow Jesus, we've got to follow those instructions that Jesus gave us and, and realize that it takes a lot of time and energy and effort, and it takes uh, a lot of patience uh, to be able to follow Jesus. And we want to do what Jesus said. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and mind and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And gave us lots of other uh, wisdom to follow uh, that sometimes was really hard to do. Uh, but if we want to follow Jesus, we've got to follow those instructions uh, and to, to love God with, with everything that we have and, and to be all in on that and to make sure that Jesus is the foundation for our lives on which everything else is built. Uh, nothing else will work if our foundation is not laid on Jesus. So let's, uh, let's say a prayer. Dear God, thank you for your love for your grace, and for the words that you gave us to help us understand what it means to follow you. We pray, God, that you would help us to count the cost and to, uh, to know what it means to follow you and to do so with our whole selves, our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to let that love pour out of us into love of neighbor. We thank you, God, for your grace that makes us who we are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear. And grace my fears relieve. How precious did that grace appear The hour I first believed My chains are gone I've been set free my God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. The Lord has promised good to me His word my hope secures He will my shield and portion be As long as life endures my chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing grace. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has
presence on me and like a flood his mercy reigns unending love amazing grace the earth shall soon dissolve like snow the sun forbear to shine but God who called me here below will be forever mine will be forever mine you are forever mine may we pray that now the words of my mouth, meditations of my heart, Lord, let them be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my everlasting Redeemer. It's through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Well, it was wonderful to be here on this wonderful morning once again. And we do praise God for life, health, and strength. Uh, we want to welcome back a former member of ours, she a former percussionist, and so who's now in Virginia. Uh, she made me aware of that, so uh, thank you for letting us know. You can just raise your hand. You don't have to stand, but we're glad to see you back. Uh, let's give that a hand this morning. Always good to have people come home and worship, and so all the way from Virginia, uh, what a blessing it is. Uh, also, I have, uh, I don't really call her a guest. Uh, I call her uh, a driving companion, but most of all, I call her uh, mama, and so I'm glad my mother is here with us today. Uh, so just raise your hand. Mama, glad to see you here with the family, so always glad to have her. Uh, what a blessing it's been uh, over the few weeks she's been here. Uh, she only told me twice how to drive my own car, and so... Uh, that is always a blessing uh, when your mother only tells you twice how to drive your car that you drive on a daily basis. And so uh, I tell her that she, she does have three children, but uh, every so often it's good for me to take her away from those other two uh, that I call siblings. Uh, and so uh, they always say that they are the favorites, and I simply say nothing. Uh, I simply tell them, for you to make that statement implies that you're not the favorite. And so, uh, but uh, all seriousness, there's no favorites. Uh, I'm just glad that she is with us uh, for a season as this. Uh, I wanted to share with you from a thought, Jesus wants followers and not fans. Jesus wants followers and We as football fans do some crazy things, don't we? Uh, some of us will pack up RVs, get to the parking lot of our favorite team so we can grill and watch the game on a big screen TV. When all we had to do was really use our own patio at our home. Fans are also finicky, aren't they? When things are going well, when they're going good for the team, we find the stands full and we cheer our favorite team on. But when the chips are down, we criticize every play, don't we? We badmouth the coaches as well as the players. We talk about the way it used to be, don't we? 
We remember Bob Stoops, or we remember Barry Switzer and the championships that they won. Or we even remember the good old days when OSU actually won national championships. But however, we talk about the way things used to be. Fans come in frenzies. They feed on the excitement and they vanish when the difficult times come. The sad truth is that many Christians resemble football fans. They rally around excitement and they run from work. They're encouraging good times and they criticize when things are not going well. They fill the pews and in many cases, sometimes they love to be entertained. Our Lord Jesus understood this. And in this text, we find Jesus on his way to Jerusalem. A crowd has now gathered around him. And in fact, the Bible says that great multitudes were all around him. When Jesus saw the multitudes, he turned to them and said, in essence, I'm not looking for fans. I'm looking for followers. Jesus is saying that to us today, Sonny Lane. He's saying what he said to the multitudes in his day. I need more followers and not fans. It is easy to be a fan. Fans are here today and gone tomorrow. But following takes a commitment. Following takes sacrifice. And unfortunately, the church is filled in many cases around the country with fans rather than followers. We have people in pews across the country that are fans of the building they gather in. They're in those, those in church today who are fans of the preacher or maybe the worship leader. There are those who are even fans of our Lord Jesus. But however, it is tragic that they have never made the transition to become an actual follower of Jesus. Today, it's time for us to declare our loyalty. It's time for us to decide if we're going to be a fan of Jesus or a follower of the Christ. Today, as we look at the text, we find some truths that help us understand what it takes to become a follower of Jesus Christ rather than a fan. First, we realize there is a cost to following Jesus Christ. This cost is twofold. First, it begins with a supreme commitment. Remember, Jesus said to these multitudes, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, yes, even his own or her own life, they cannot be my disciple. We here have these words, and then we think, did I really hear that correctly? Did I read that correctly? Did Jesus really tell me that if I want to follow him, I have to forsake those who are closest to me? This apparently seems to be the complete opposite of what we know about God and God's character. And after all, the Bible reminds us that God is love. However, Jesus told us in other places that we must also love one another. And in fact, the Bible teaches that people will know that we are the children of God by the way we love each other. But yet here, Jesus is telling us to forsake in order to follow him. It gets even more confusing. And we, as we look at Matthew 10, 34 through 37, when Jesus says, do not think that I come to bring peace on earth. I did not come peace, but to bring a sword. For some, Jesus reminds us the ultimate commitment, the ultimate sacrifice in becoming a follower of the Lord. To understand this, we must understand that the Bible is not contradicting itself. We realize that these statements represent a comparative idea. Yes, God is love. Yes, we are to love one another. And after all, love is the summation of all the law of God. Jesus summed up the Ten Commandments with two statements about our love for God and our neighbor. 
But however, in this text, Jesus says today, if you come after me, if you're thinking about following me, you must love me more than anyone or anything in this universe. Jesus is saying that when you compare your love for me and your love for every relationship, it should appear as though you love me more and it should outshine everything else in this world. I'll give you an example. If someone were to gauge and ask you, what is your love for your spouse on a scale of one to 10? I'm hoping you would say 10, especially if they are present. I hope. If someone were to gauge, ask you to gauge your love for your children on a scale of one to 10, I really hope you would still say 10. Uh, in spite of the sleepless nights and maybe a few gray hairs they probably have given you down <laughs> through the years. But your answer would probably be 10. However, if someone were to ask you to gauge your love for Jesus, it should say 1 million out of 10. Because our love for Christ should have no comparison. In other words, our love that we have compared to family, to friends, our love for Jesus should be more than anything on earth. Quite frankly, we cannot love anyone else more than we should love our Lord and Savior. You see, this cost of following Christ, it begins with a supreme commitment. It continues a supreme sacrifice. Jesus said to the multitudes, whoever does not bear their cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. What does it mean to bear his cross? Well, I'm glad you asked that question, Sonny Lane. It means that we often hear people talk about the problems of life and suggest that those are simply the crosses we have to bear. But however, I believe that we're missing the greater truth. I believe the cross of Christ represents sacrifice. Jesus came to the cross because of sin. And Paul reminds us that the wages of sin is death. And so because of that sin, someone had to die. That someone should have been you or me. But however, because of our depravity, we could not have freed ourselves from sin. And so Jesus paid the price for us. And so the cross points to the perfection of the sacrifice of Christ who became our payment for sin. Jesus died for our sins and therefore we must join him in that journey. That's what carrying a cross is all about. Carrying the cross is to reckon yourself, to be dead to sin but alive to God and Jesus Christ. It is to say that the old person was crucified with him that the new body might be raised. Carrying the cross is also dedicating yourself to the Lord, now and forever. It is when you determine that you will not be conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable in, in the perfect will of God. Being a follower comes with a cost. And if we want to be followers rather than fans, we must make the supreme commitment to forsake all and take up the supreme sacrifice to turn from sin and self so that we may be fully committed to Jesus. Secondly, there is a concern. And it reoccurs throughout this passage. It is the word cannot. We see this word many times in this passage. Jesus says to the multitudes that those who do not come after him with this level of commitment cannot be his disciples. 
You see, the word cannot is a compound word in the Greek. It is the words ouk dunamai. The Greek word ouk means not. And the word dunamai means power or ability. That's where we get the word dynamite from, dunamis or dunamai. And so, in other words, Jesus is saying that those who try to come after him with less than the total commitment do not have power or ability to become followers or disciples. I don't know I've shared this story with you before, but I, I go back to this story that whenever we ordain elders in Methodist church, all the elders that are in the area come together along with the bishop and those district superintendents who are close by, and they lay their hands on you. And you begin to feel the weight of all these hands pressing down on your head. And it feels as if they're going to snap your neck and you're wondering, why in the world did I commit to this? Because I think they're going to take me out here in the annual conference. <laughs> but the weight of the hands, as the bishop always reminds us, it reminds you of the commitment that you have to the church, but most importantly, the Lord Jesus Christ. It, it reminds you of the heaviness of the commitment that you have to being a servant of the servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. It reminds you at that moment that you are not a fan, but you are a follower. The stole reminds us of not only the authority that the church gives us, but the stole also reminds us of the yoke of Christ that we are pulling for the burden of the ministry of the church. We are reminded that we are fan followers not fans. You see, Jesus warned the multitudes. He, he told them, count the cost of discipleship. He would use several illustrations in our text. It is important that those who would come to be followers of Christ to understand the level of commitment that is required of them, lest they enter only as a fan and fool themselves into thinking they are followers. How blinded are those who sit in pews on Sunday after Sunday across the country, thinking that they are followers of Christ when their level of commitment reveals that they're nothing more than fans. It is dangerous having this state of mind when you think you are a eternally ready, only to find out that you came up short because you were not willing to forsake all and follow Christ. I remember, as many of you know, that I'm not only a fan of OU football, I'm actually a follower. I follow OU football. Most of all, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. But I learned that I was a follower of OU football when I went to several colleges and universities and they were not OU, but I still followed football. I remember like it was yesterday when I became a huge follower of OU football. It was in the seventh grade at Northeast Junior High in Altus, Oklahoma, in the class of Coach Bill U. We would receive extra credit if we could guess the score or the point spread <laughs> in history class. <laughs> what a way to make you a follower, right? But even as we moved from Oklahoma to the state of Louisiana, I was an avid follower of OU football. For me, my favorite team was the 1985 team that won the Orange Bowl against Penn State. They had one loss that year to Miami. That year, the quarterback was a quarterback by the name of Jamel Hollowell. Number four, Barry Switzer was the coach, and they ran the triple option. In the backfield was... Uh, Lydell Carr, uh, Spencer Collins. And on the wing was number 88, Keith Jackson. Although that team would go on to win the national championship, beat Penn State with only one loss, I would forever be a follower of OU football. Even when Barry Switzer would leave and others would come and then Bob Stoops would take over, I would still follow OU football. Even during the Lincoln-Riley era and those who were in between, I would still follow OU football. 
And even right now, I follow OU football. Nothing against OSU. I think OSU has a great program. But I follow OU football with tenacity. But however, I am a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Wherever I'm sent, I serve. I'm always reminded of my ordination, my commitment, as I've served in the states of Louisiana, states of Georgia, Ohio, and the states of Arizona, in the countries of Qatar, Kuwait, preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, representing the church. I'm always reminded that I'm a follower of Christ. And even under the punishment of sometimes being in an Islamic country, which Christianity, of course, is not the state religion, but nonetheless, we still preach the gospel to our airmen, sailors, soldiers, and Marines. I'm reminded that I am a follower of Jesus Christ, who commands me to go to the uttermost parts of the world, teaching and preaching, and reminded that, and lo, he is with me even to the end of the ages. In this text, Jesus confirmed that there will be many who will be merely fans rather than followers. He said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus was saying, I need followers, not fans. He also confirmed that there will be many revealed as merely fans painted up in a tapestry of Christianity when he said, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? He said, and I will declare to them, I never knew you depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Sonny Lane there are some exciting things that are ahead. There's a great energy in the church. And I caution you of the danger of being a fan of Christ. I remind you that it takes a total commitment to be a follower of Christ. We take these vows by way of the United Methodist Church. Jesus is looking for followers not fans. Many fans are lost and headed for eternal separation from God. But however, followers, followers of the Lord Jesus Christ are God's children who are assured an eternal home in his kingdom. But it's time for us to decide which one are we today? Are you a, a fan? I'm not talking about OSU. I'm not talking about Kansas or Iowa or USC or even Dallas Cowboys or Green Bay Packers or the New Orleans Saints. What I'm asking you, have you chosen to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ? This is the word of God for God's people. Thanks be to God. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, we give thanks. Amen.
I'd like to invite Tom and Donna Duhon to come forward at this time to offer us our stewardship moment this morning. Uh, as I mentioned at the outset uh, of the service, uh, we are still in our stewardship series uh, this, this month. Uh, and again, uh, during the Hymn of Commitment, uh, we'll bring forth our uh, commitment cards. Uh, so uh, Tom and Donna, come and give us a word this morning. Just so you know, Adam offered me a step stool. <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't let him get away with that. Uh, uh, we were asked to reflect uh, on the steward during the stewardship campaign, and we were given three questions. So uh, we each answered those, and we're going to give you our responses here. So what do you love about Sunny Lane? We love the kind hearts, supportive people, giving people, and potluck people. People that can buy underwear and socks, buy cans of food for Skyline, or donate clothing and household items to support our community and our even greater Oklahoma City community. We love the people that have supported us when we were struggling and look forward to helping others inside and outside our church. What do I love about Sunny Lane? Because Jesus is here. We celebrate, love, and pray as a family. When someone in our family has a need, be it support or prayer, there is always a helpful hand and a willing heart. You all know our story, our 17-year journey with Trevor. Most of it I remember, but some of it is a blur. But I still remember this, the night Trevor had brain surgery for his biopsy. To this day, I can still see the surgery waiting room with Mike Werfel, Dan and Matt Stevens, Lisa Ritchie, Dennis, and Carla Atchley. They held us up as the surgeon told us Trevor had cancer. Sunny Lane never stopped caring and loving, but most importantly, praying. And now you never forget. The second question is, why do you give to support Sunny Lane? We give to Sunny Lane because we want to support programs that make us more caring and stronger, make others in our church stronger, and make our community stronger. Why do I give to Sunny Lane? Let's be real. It costs to keep the doors open. Aside from the fact that there are the usual bills such as heating and air, salaries, and building maintenance, it takes funds for the fun stuff too, like potlucks and Christmas parties and various outreaches that we use as opportunities for community outreach. And the last question is, what are you most looking forward to seeing God do through Sunny Lane in the coming year? I think that we can make ourselves stronger so that we can continue to support each other and be able to make other programs that help reach our community through this church. I am looking forward to seeing and hearing children and youth in our services, hallways, and classrooms. I look forward to visitors that feel welcomed and supported. And of course, I look forward to the occasional baked potato, salad, and cobbler. Uh, where we can all sit together at one time. We are excited about the future of our church with small changes and big changes and willing people with big hearts to see a dream and make it a reality. Let's do this together with our donations and prayers and working hands and hearts. What am I most looking forward to in the coming year? I am looking forward to God seeing for I am looking forward to seeing us soar. God can do more than we think and our expectations are high. When we pray, we are convinced he will answer the way we want, but it doesn't always happen that way. We tend to want things done when and in our time, it just doesn't happen that way. We have to wait on him and in his time and in his way. My favorite scripture, Isaiah 40:31 says, 
but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on eagles' wings. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. I am looking forward to seeing Sunny Lane run with hope and strength and energy and finally watch us soar. Amen. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Donna, for that word of encouragement, that uh, reminder that we will soar on eagle's wings. And, and thank you, Tom, for the reminders of all of the different people and uh, the different ways that, uh, that, that God has impacted um, our lives through Sunny Lane. And, and also for the reminder of all the good food that we get to eat here as Methodists. Yeah, I think where, where two or three are gathered, where two or three Methodists are gathered, there's a potluck. So I, uh, I am grateful for that. As we prepare to receive our gifts of tithes and, and offerings, uh, we are looking forward to uh, hearing a wonderful uh, piece of music, uh, again, from Taylor. But as you do so, I encourage you to to carefully consider uh, what your commitment for the coming year will be. Uh, we have some commitment cards in the back, and, and Dean, if you'll, I'm going to pull an audible on here for you. If there's anybody that needs a commitment card, if you'll just raise your hand, and Dean will, Dean will help you out uh, with that, uh, and we'll get those to you during while well, we uh, are sharing in the offertory. Let us pray. Mighty God. Just as you restore sight to the blind and benevolence to the afflicted, use these offerings to provide refuge for the lost and mercy for those who suffer. May our gifts find those who cry out in their need and who seek you with their whole hearts. We ask this in Jesus' name, the name above all names. Amen.
invite Linda Coonfield to uh, offer our flower dedication and uh, flame of hope and remembrance this morning. Still not doing it. Okay. Um, good morning. This morning, as you were coming into church, many of you received a pink bracelet. Um, as most of you know, this is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. But like the kettles at Christmas time says, need knows no season. Cancer doesn't have a season either. Um, it's not just. It doesn't just happen in October, or it doesn't just happen in January or whatever. It happens all around us all the time. When Adam asked me to speak to this um, in reference to the, the flowers and the flame of hope and remembrance this morning, um, I started thinking about people from this church that we've lost to cancer. Um, we have quite a list, and I'm sure I didn't think of everybody. But I thought back years ago when Paige Hamlin was in the hospital, and we all threw all of our support behind Sandra and Warner. Um, Molly. I don't remember how many of you remember little Molly that we worked months raising money to support her family so they could get her to her treatments. Trevor, many of us went through 17 years with that, with Donna and Tom. Most recently, or fairly recently, my own niece is battling breast cancer. Felix's wife, Camille, is battling breast cancer. And really most recently, Don and Kay Brader's 17-year-old daughter has been, granddaughter, sorry, has been diagnosed with lymphoma. So what I'm asking you for today is not to look at that bracelet and think of breast cancer, but to think of that supporting all those people in our community, in our family, in our church that are battling some kind of breast, some kind of cancer or some other disease, it doesn't matter. Let's just remember to be with them. So this morning, the flowers, we have two bouquets. One is dedicated to Billy Crouch. Happy birthday, Billy. And the other is dedicated to those who have fought, who are fighting, continue to fight for whatever cancer they may be fighting against. And I would ask that we would all be aware, be in prayer, and let's all be in this together. Thank you. So we enter into our time of prayer. I have several uh, needs to lift to your attention. To lift up Chuck and Carol Rosser. Um, also want to lift up um, Bill Rosser, this is Chuck's brother, uh, for Amy Brown, uh, one who has also been diagnosed with breast cancer, uh, for Tony Mosby, for Woody Reed, uh, for Brooklyn Hawkins, uh, who we mentioned earlier, for Alicia Price, uh, for the uh, family of Dennis Malm, uh, for Dana Jones, and for Mary Thomas as well. And also want to uh, provide a couple of updates. Uh, Martha Ferris actually passed away yesterday. Uh, so prayers with uh, her family. And Jean Stewart also passed away yesterday. Uh, so we will let you know as soon as we know when those uh, funerals will be. Uh, I'm sure they'll be in the next week or so. Uh, and then, of course, this afternoon, we'll be doing the memorial service uh, for Harold Shorty Keck. Uh, Shorty was a member here a while back, uh, and his wife, uh, Mary, has asked us to uh, help out with that. She's good friends with uh, Rose Emmerling, and, and so we are happy to be able to, to do that. And uh, that will be at 2 o'clock this afternoon. So prayers for uh, Shorty and uh, his family. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this life, for the beauty of it. And even in the midst of difficulty, even when we 
are facing challenges uh, uh, like cancer. We know that you walk with us through the valley of the shadow of death, and we have nothing to fear because you are near, your rod and your staff that comfort and that keep us. We give you thanks, Lord, that your presence never leaves us or forsakes us. Your love never fails. Your love remains steadfast through it all. We give you thanks, God, that you keep us close, that you enfold each and every one of us in your loving arms, and that we are never alone. We are never alone. We thank you, God, for that. And we pray, God, that you would help each one of us, strengthen each one of us to be true followers and not just fans of you, O Christ. We ask, Lord, that you would guide us and lead us in all things and lead us even now in the prayer you taught your disciples to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand as you are able for our final hymn. And as a reminder, if you have not brought down your commitment card, you may do so during the singing of this closing hymn.
Just a quick reminder for our admin council, we'll be meeting in the fellowship hall and lunch will be provided right, right after this. As you go from this time and this place, as you have been fed, go to feed the hungry. As you have been set free, go to set free the imprisoned. As you have received, give. As you have heard, proclaim. And the blessing which you have received from the Creator, Christ, and the Holy Spirit be with you always. Together we say, Amen.